So I'm really very happy to uh, introduce you to the two participants in the name of Engadin Art Talk. And it's um, the distinguished professor Dario Gamboni, art historian, and Peter Fishley, the artist, and he's also teacher and curator and the other part of Fishley Weiss. We have under the table a little dog, which is also greeting us. And uh, <laughs> I would like to, to ask you, Peter, uh, it was your wish, to your choice, to ask Dario Gamboni for this uh, little conversation about um, iconoclasm, about um, vandalism in art. Um, Dario Gamboni published this uh, really important book in 97. In English it's called uh, it's called Vandalism, sure. Destruction sure. of Art. Destruction of Art. The book uh, came out in French, in German, probably in other languages too. Peter, why have you chosen this topic? Well, I start, the whole thing started with you, uh, BJ, asking me if I would have an idea to say something about the topic of this, um, this year's Engadin Art Talk, La Longue Durée. And so I was thinking, um, how could I twist this topic into the topic that I'm interested in the moment and found out that um, maybe the, the paradox or like the, um, uh, the situation that would mirror the long durée uh, on a negative side would be iconoclasts. Because, because these are, if we think on long durée as art history or history that goes quietly uh, from one step to the next, so um, the iconoclast uh, gestures would be the gestures who make the interruption in the long durée. So there is like, uh, it's a certain paradox to talk about like these, these, these uh, two topics who are contrary on the first, uh, in the first moment. So um, this is like, yeah, more like an excuse <laughs> why I sneak in on this topic. Uh, what, is, what was before was that I'm working on a project, um, curating a show on, on painting that has the title Stop Painting, which is uh, basically, it starts with Kurt Schwitters and goes till the now. No, it starts with uh, Paul Delaroche uh, and goes till now. And uh, Jimmy. Jimmy, no, no, um, and which um, goes through five moments of um, of modernism, where uh, crisis or moments of interruptions happened, and these moments of interruption often are like they are iconoclastic gestures against the established canon. So, I mean, that's a possible way to see it. And that's why I uh, looked at your book very carefully and I really liked it. And I did uh, yeah, research on that topic, especially on iconoclasm in 20th century, which your book is focused on. A little bit also, I was interested in uh, what Stoichita, uh, is saying in his book about like, especially about like the white wall and uh, uh, the meta painting. The painting, yeah. So, I mean, my question to you would be like a, a very first general question if you would see this as a, a possible model to look at it. Or would you say, no, iconoclast 
is not is 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 more a radical gesture and can't look just like a, just like an interruption or an attacking the established canon. That's not iconoclasm. I think that's very interesting and very relevant. The connection you established between uh, the long durée, the general topic, and that of iconoclasm, because in a sense, indeed, one can imagine to think of art or the history of art is a sort of accumulation, a cumulative process of things adding to each other and building up heritage. I think one way to, be, to put it would be to speak of heritage. And then the moments or the actions of iconoclasm would come as a sort of, as you say, of interruptions, of, of breaks into this uh, process. But on the other hand, one can see that in another way and think that iconoclasm belongs very much to the longue durée. In fact, it is an extremely ancient phenomenon. It's as old as making art, taking art in the broadest sense. Um, there are traces of that in the earliest uh, periods. And one could, I would go so far as to say, I think I, I, I propose that in one chapter of my book, rather towards the end, to consider that iconoclasm is part of the process of making heritage, because the process of making heritage is a process of selection. And you have two gestures involved. One is preserving things, and another is putting other things away. And by the same gesture that you select something to be protected and to be preserved and to be passed on to future generations. Typically, Denkmalpflege, if you wish. So you, you, you select some buildings or some parts of cities that you think for various reasons are worthy of protection and of preservation. But by the same gesture, you exclude other ones. This is generally done in a quiet way. So you just leave things be prey to economic processes, modernizations, and so on. But sometimes you can do it that also more actively, if you wish, and then it appears as something negative. In another connection, <clears throat> I think, so I, I propose to speak of qualification and disqualification. And to see iconoclasm as one particularly evident and sometimes violent means of disqualification, to make something, this is, not worth some, I, I want that away. I, or even it can go so far as to say, like now against some monuments, I cannot bear to see that thing. It must, it must go away. Um, and I think there's also, when you suggested this sort of long procession of art, of the history of art, uh, there is the idea of progress involved, which is so important to us, at least since the 19th century, but it starts earlier. If you think of Vasari, his story, history of art is also one of progress and decadence. And I think there's a strong connection between the notion of progress and the ideal, the radical version, which is tabula rasa. So the desire to, to get rid of, to make a new start, completely new. And I think what this exhibition that you're curating, this idea of um, stop painting, seems to me part of that in a sense. So. Uh, this tradition must be finished, and so we can start something new, something really completely new. The only thing that I would add, what I was afraid, or, or I also can hear it now already a little bit, that we talk about art history from something that is detached from political realities, and, uh, or like, let's say, uh, iconoclastic gestures happens also when shifts of values happens in society. And these shifts of values happen, can happen through uh, political change, but also uh, they can be technolo technological changes or they go like hand in hand. So um, do not think at something, at at art history as being something in, in a white cube that is detected from the, this I was, and uh, especially for my project, I didn't want it to end with an academic question of this. And so um, this is also what, 
what I think, um, how I can make a connection to the now, uh, is how we see that the established canon of art history since five or ten years, like let's say the, the history of modernism especially, has to be really rethinked. So, um, and, and this, would you see this, this also as a part of, um, of provoking the, what provokes the iconoclastic gesture? In fact, the, the a major interest of iconoclasm as a phenomenon and all that can be understood under this term is precisely that it uh, makes it impossible to consider art as something uh, detached from the rest of, of social life. And in fact, it's really, when I started working on uh, iconoclasm and vandalism, um, it was a topic that had been researched for the Reformation and the, the revolution and so on, but very little for the 20th century. And um, the few people who were interested in that, people like Martin Warnke, Horst Bredekam in Germany, were very much social historians of art and people for whom politics and, and were, was extremely important. And that's also the reason why I became interested in that because I thought that um, I started with this exhibition that took place in Bienn in Biel in 1980 where half of the works had been attacked by one did not know who. And for the, for the people who were in the art world and including the organizers, that, had, that must have, have nothing to do with the, with the art itself because this was a danger to consider that there was any meaningful connection. And then working to that, yes, I thought, no, it makes sense, at least about the reception of art, not necessarily the intentions of the artist, but how, how the art was perceived in a specific context, which was that of a small industrial town, which was still in an in a economic crisis. And that, that, of course, impacted the way that people uh, felt and how they uh, were encountered these works in their everyday environment, which was part of the, of the, of the meaning of the intentions of the exhibition. So uh, I completely agree. And it is true. I, I would say as far as academic art history is concerned, there has been so much done on the connections with uh, politics and economics and, and religion and so on. So I don't think that this is something that is lacking, if you wish. It can be that as far as um, contemporary art is concerned, there is more an effect of a sort of um, how should I say, in, in, in a sort of self-contained world in which either you speak about the art or you speak about something else, but there's no, the connections are not made. And, um, and it, it's also less easy, if you wish, because you don't have the same kind of distance and access to documents also, which makes it more difficult. Today, the present, of course, is marked by very strong changes in values. You alluded to that. And that clearly has an impact on the way that uh, works of art are, are concerned. Mm -hmm. Works of art that are produced or that are in museums or, that, or monuments and, and so on. We had a phone call conversation about preparing this talk. And then you were bringing in this moment of the, the psychoanalytic view of, of uh, you were bringing in the argument of the father mord. Could you say a little bit something <laughs> about that? I think that's also just like that we cover different <laughs> angles. <laughs> well, yes, if we talk about the canon and go back um, to the change of generations in the, in the course of time, um, of course, there is this uh, psychological moment that you always have to get rid of uh, the uh, forms which had a meaning uh, for a certain generation, but the generation afterwards thinks these forms have become hollow and uh, they have to uh, ridicule them or attack them or make a tabula rasa. I mean, if we have uh, European art history and then we look at post-war 
uh, American art scene, um, it, there was a, a topic also to get rid of the European dominance um, in, in, in the whole spectrum of uh, approaching the task to do new art. And uh, of course, you, you can look at it in a psychoanalytical way, but in, also in a pragmatic way. Do we need a canon, actually, nowadays? This is what we could ask. Do we really need a canon? Uh, is it not possible to do art uh, without a canon? Are we always building up? Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. a new variation or a, a, a radical uh, version um, of a new canon and or is even the idea of radicality have become has has it become uh, obsolete well the the oedipus um, argument or comparison has often been made and for some good reasons i mean one can think of um, a Rauschenberg's uh, erased de Kooning drawing is, of course, a wonderful prototypical example of that. So uh, in 53, if I remember well, Rauschenberg uh, going to visit de Kooning and asking him for a drawing so that he could erase it. And de Kooning very gently providing. Which is already a nice contradiction that the moment the, uh, the aggressor uh, is asking to make an end and has uh, the allowedness, uh, this is kind of... Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's very civil. It's, it's the way you would like maybe things to happen. If you think of changes, passing of power, right now what is happening in the US, you would like things to happen that way, if you wish. Mm -hmm. I mean, passing, okay, let, let me let somebody else come and take my place. But, um, but other people like the um, Russian activist or performance artist Brenner did not ask Malevich, who was dead anyway, when he sprayed a green dollar sign on top of a, uh, <coughs> of a suprematist painting in, in, uh, in Amsterdam. So you also have that. But I, I would think that there is a psychological side to that. But of course, there's also a more structural one, or you could say sociological, which is what I'm thinking, what Pierre Bourdieu called the artistic field or any field in which you have people who are in positions of power and you are people who are arriving and want to have their place in the sun and they need to take it. I mean, it, it will not necessarily be given to them. So there is this agonistic, this element of competition, which is embedded in the, the way that art the art world works as many or any other world. So I think that's pretty standard, if you wish. And of course, this is also, there is an ideological side to that, the notion of creative destruction. And now it's new, it's new version of creative disruption is something that has been also accompanying capitalism. I mean, Schumpeter showed that and it's still very, very much present. It has actually be become ever more aggressive. So I think that is, that is part of it too. As far as the canon is concerned, do we need it, do we don't? I mean, it's something, um, I suppose that there are always points of reference um, in connection with which one defines oneself. And for any discipline, I would say, there is also an, an element of community. Mm -hmm. I think the same with art history, if you wish, as an academic field too. Um, you need uh, to have certain, um, points of reference uh, in connection with which you define yourself. You agree with them, you admire them, or you despise them, or you reject them, but uh, there's something intersubjective. You are not alone, or you may choose them for yourself. I mean, you can say, well, for me now, this totally forgotten artist is important. This has been happening, for instance, for women artists also. We had forgotten these people, now they are important. If you are successful, you persuade, you convince other people that they are important, then they become part of a new canon. Um, there's nothing bad or good about it, but it become, it makes a, a common, a conversation possible, if you wish. If each person has its own, his, her own um, models and anti-models, then I don't think much happens collectively. 
So, I mean, to, to now slowly come to an end, we could uh, optimistically say it's, it's good to have the long durée going back um, in, the, in the deep of, of time to understand all the mechanisms and um, possibilities, options that open up maybe looking at history. Well, maybe uh, personally, and not only as a historian, also as a lover of art, I find that amnesia, we tend to live in a sort of amnesia, um, very short durée, très courte durée. Mm -hmm. um, and technology has um, emphasized that, the impression that all that counts has been happening in the last, what, 10 years, all before that is prehistory. I find that a nuisance. It's ridiculous. Um, life is so much richer when we still take into account and, and are aware that there's so much that is with us that is much older, much, much older. We can connect with that. We can do something with it. It's, it can be part of us and we can be part of it. I think that's so much better. So I, I would argue for, I argue in any case for the long period.